So today we'll talk about kind of, um, you know, in, in whenever you're running a deep neural network, that's not the only thing that's running. There is other stuff that's going on as well. And this is kind of an emerging topic, like uh, unlike, you know, quantization or pruning, which is quite a well-established topic now in neural network efficiency. This is, people are, are only starting to pay attention to this um, right now. So, uh, so we'll discuss a lot of um, interesting uh, ideas around this, what kind of overheads we have in the pre and post processing um, in kind of a DNN centric computation model where your main workload is a deep neural network, but then you also have to consider everything that's going on around it as well. Um, so um, yeah, this also marks kind of the beginning of our last module. So we have, uh, I think four more lectures to go, uh, and then that's it in terms of um, lectures at least. Um, so, uh, so we're going to talk about systems and this is the first lecture in that module. Um, yeah, and other stuff we'll talk about here includes kind of, you know, multi-device training like distributed training or federated learning. Uh, and also we will have kind of a discussion lecture about environmental and ethical issues related to systems uh, from machine learning. And that will be more of a round table discussion. So come with your ideas, but that's uh, next week, hopefully. Um, yeah, so, um, so what is ML systems all about? Um, it's, you know, it's about um, actual, basically it's the real world deployment of uh, a machine learning model or a deep neural network in our case, which is our focus. Um, you know, what happens when you need to deploy this on a phone? What happens when you need to train a very large model with multiple uh, devices? Um, how do you kind of synchronize between the devices? How do you connect the devices even? Um, what, um, like I said, what kind of pre and post processing do you need to do? Um, yeah, I'm hearing a bit of an echo, maybe the ceiling mics are on. Um, so, um, so yeah, so, so what we will discuss in the next, this and the next three lectures is how do we scale machine learning uh, both in data centers and on mobile devices? Um, how do we um, run it on multiple devices, but how do we also run it on one device uh, efficiently considering system issues, not considering the deep neural network efficiency anymore because we've already talked about that. So, so we'll start kind of the lecture with a question. Um, and it's a fairly simple one, it should be covered by some of your elementary courses. Um, but basically if, if I have a workload and the deep neural network component of it is 70% of that workload, right? And I optimize that part 10X, it's 10 times faster. So what is my overall system speed up? Um, so take a minute, write it down on a piece of paper, think about it for, for a bit. Um, if, yeah, so, so I mean, the techniques we discussed so far can get you 10X on a deep neural network. Uh, but usually, you know, there's other stuff that's going on. So we want to know what's my end-to-end -end system improvement if I actually get this order of magnitude improvement on the DNN. Okay. We'll move on to the answer. So the answer is 2.7X. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm a deep learning engineer, I'm working on efficiency and I'm, you know, I'm working on the compiler level, I'm working at the deep neural network level, I'm working on all kinds of levels of the stack. I optimized my hardware to run the neural network really fast and I get 10x improvement and I go to, you know, my manager, or my boss or something and I tell him I got 10x improvement, but then he says, ah, no, you actually got 2.7x improvement. So it's much smaller, right? And um, and this is basically called Amdahl's law. Um, who who remembers Amdahl's law? Kind of. Oh, okay. No. Wow. It's okay. So Amdahl's law is really important, and it's one of the simplest laws out there. But basically, um, we'll we'll see it on the next slide. But basically, you know, if if you're optimizing one piece of a system, you really have to pay attention to the rest of the pieces, because even if the rest of the pieces are really small they can limit your overall throughput significantly. And so I plotted here just, you know, what is the speed up uh, in this, you know, fictitious system that we constructed if we, um, if we keep speeding up just the neural network portion. 
So first you get a lot of, you know, bang for your buck, basically. You, you optimize it like, you know, less than 10x and you keep getting like a, a steep improvement in overall system performance. But at some point it, it quickly saturates, you know, at this 3.3x number. So even if, you know, your neural network disappears completely, you still have 30%. So even if, if this one becomes, you know, lightning fast, um, this 30% isn't touched. So, um, so this is what, you know, Amdel's law is all about. You, um, your speed up is typically um, not limited by just the biggest part of your system, but also the other parts. And so, um, let me see. And so, um, and so this is what the law looks like. It's, it's very simple. It's basically, you know, we have um, this important thing that we're running uh, denoted by P here. That's the runtime of the deep neural network. So what if I speed that, you know, S times? So in, in our example, it was 10 times. Um, so now, you know, that runtime is divided by 10. Um, but, you know, the rest of the system stays the same. So one minus P. Uh, all of kind of the rest of it, this 30% is constant. So this remains constant while this keeps shrinking as I speed up, you know, the DNN in this case, uh, which limits overall speed up. And this is, you know, a quote from Mr. Amdahl. So basically the overall performance improvement gained by optimizing a single part of a system is limited by the fraction of time the improved part is actually used. Um, so Amdahl's law is, you know, it's, it's one of those, you know, it's sometimes people call it Amdahl's observation because it's, just, it's such a simple thing. It's not really a law. It doesn't include, you know, physics or, or kind of device characteristics or anything more profound than, than just this. But it's importance I found in, um, in actually deploying these systems uh, is quite high. Like uh, time and again, uh, we're working on, you know, a deep neural network, we're optimizing it. And then it turns out that that's not the issue anymore. It's, it's everything else. Um, so one example is that we were working with a security camera company. Um, and they had a system where they had, you know, a CPU FPGA system. And then uh, it was PCIe attached. So it's connected through a link from the CPU to an FPGA, which is a typical kind of accelerator organization. And we kept speeding up the FPGA. I think we got like 23x performance improvement over the CPU. Um, but then we still had some pre-processing on the CPU. And we couldn't move that easily to the FPGA because we have to, you know, create custom hardware for it and custom IP and so on. And then we still had to transfer the data to the CPU over this PCIe link. Um, and so all of that kind of meant that our whole system was 1.6x uh, faster than just a CPU system. And of course, to a company, they look at that and they say, ah, oh, that's extra cost. That's, you know, extra effort uh, in maintaining that kind of design. And so is it really worth that 60% improvement? And in, in our case, actually, it wasn't. And we lost that uh, bid. So, so taking care of kind of the whole system um, is super important in, in industry, I found. So any, any questions or comments about Amdahl's law? So basically, this lecture is about Amdahl's law in deep, in deep learning and, uh, and how it's important in various places. Yeah. Yeah, so that's an interesting point. Uh, we will actually focus mainly on inference, uh, and it is super relevant in inference and deploying the model, that's, that's for sure. But in training, you do have pre-processing as well. And so what is that pre-processing um, and post-processing? You know, you have data augmentation. Uh, when you have multiple devices, you have gradients propagating from one device to the other. So we consider that also kind of an AI overhead, just moving the data around. Um, so, uh, so we'll discuss kind of overheads at different levels of the system stack. Um, and you can kind of infer um, the importance of them to something like distributed training. One thing to keep in mind also is, um, you know, training is a very um, like heavy workload, right? But in terms of just total GPU or device cycles um, in industry in general, um, I think inference is either one or two magnitudes more uh, overall because you train the model once, but you deploy it and you scale it depending on the number of users, whereas training scales with the size of the model.
right? So, uh, so for a company like Google or Facebook, when they scale something to their number of users, it starts becoming much larger. So typically, again, for ML systems, um, you know, it, don't underestimate inference. Even though the workload itself is much smaller than training, it, you usually need to scale it to many more people and many more instances. So, any other questions or thoughts? But yeah, but this is this is basically what the lecture is about. <laughs> so, uh, so I mentioned you know different layers of a system stack, um, and this is not kind of a formal uh, definition of layers or anything. And and when it comes to kind of deep learning systems, you won't find any formal systems definitions, um, kind of unlike networking, for example, where you have those uh, those well defined um, layers. Um, but, um, but let's call them, you know, we have a deployment layer. You know, how do you deploy your actual system? So usually you use, you know, Docker and Kubernetes or, or something like that. Um, who knows what that is, by the way? Uh, do people know? Yeah, Docker is well known, okay. So basically it's, um, you know, people created, I, I don't know much about it, but basically it's people created these virtual machines and then they wanted something lighter than a virtual machine. So they kind of created this Docker system where they package all the required dependencies in a piece of software, and you can basically move that thing across devices in a virtualized way, so that you don't have to kind of um, uh, yeah you, you kind of have um, compatibility support through that Docker instead of the actual machine. So it abstracts away the machine, in case you didn't know. So. Um, so that's kind of one layer, and there are overheads associated with that. There are a lot of overheads actually. And then, you know, you have your application. So what are you actually running? Um, one example, and the example that we'll look at is face detection. That's actually the example for the security camera thing that we were working on as well. No big surprise. Um, and, you know, what kind of overheads do you have there? Um, and then at, even at the hardware level, um, you have overheads or you have, you know, things unrelated to your application that you need to account for in your overall throughput. And one example is just transfer of data. So usually uh, in an accelerator, you have a host. A host is typically a CPU. And then you have the accelerator and everything goes through the host. And so you have to transfer the data through PCIe to the accelerator. And that's one piece of overhead as well. Okay, so let's jump into an example. And this is also from one of your assigned readings. Um, called AI tax. Um, and this, this paper is like 37 pages, but it's not, it's not too bad. Like you can, you can skim through many parts of it because it gives a lot of context. Um, so I recommend reading it. Um, but basically we have, you know, a very simple system here where you have a video stream coming in. Um, you ingest those video frames um, um, and then, you know, you run face detection on them. Um, and after face detection, you run feature ex extraction, and then classification. So what does that mean? You, you kind of detect where the faces are, and then you take each face, and you extract some features from it, and typically that becomes like a feature vector. And then you have classification, which is typically you know, matching that feature vector to a stored set of feature vectors, and then you figure out who's in that picture. And that's how surveillance works. Uh, and that was actually also the system we were working on at Intel. And then you identify who that person is. Um, in, in our system, we also had, uh, you know, various characteristics about that person. So whether, you know, the, you know, eye color, hair color, um, you know, um, even, even race and ethnicity and things like that, which, uh, which is quite, um, you know, debatable if it's something that we should run. And this is one of the things we should probably discuss in this lect last lecture about ethical environmental issues. Um, in, in my case, this system was in China. And um, I'm kind of glad we didn't uh, we didn't get that bid actually because I, I wasn't sure if it was um, if it was a good thing to work on. But anyways, that's another story. So um, so yeah, so this is the example system here, and you know um, shaded gray are all the boxes that have some DNN processing, right? So already you can see that there's stuff that's happening that doesn't have a deep neural network, um, and so ingesting the frames and just you know. Um, you know, capturing uh, frames from the video stream. Um, so that's one thing that's, that doesn't have um, any DNN processing, is just basically organizing the frames into um, raw pixels and then feeding them into the vase detection system. Um, 
And so if I want to deploy this using, for example, Docker, um, then you typically don't, if you want to deploy this on a large scale, you typically don't just uh, deploy one instance of it. You usually have, you know, hundreds of cameras, um, like we do here on campus even, and you, uh, you kind of have a system which scales with the number of cameras quite easily. And that's where usually Kubernetes comes in. Um, so, so what I can do is that, you know, I connect all those camera streams um, to a bunch of instances of my container. And so I'll create a container that has both ingest and detection um, on, one, on one machine, on one image. And then I'll create another container which has, you know, identification because that's, you know, roughly balances my workload and that's how I want to deploy it. Um, but then between those um, containers, you can, you, can, you can assume that each one of them is running on a different machine in data center, right? And so you have, you know, this instance running here doing ingest and detection. And then you have another instance that sprouts somewhere over there in my data center. And it's doing identification based on that results from ingest. Um, and so how do they communicate? So there is something called a broker. And this is, um, I think, what, what is it called? Apache Kafka uh, kind of terminology. But in general, you need something to manage that communication, to tell me where to, to manage communication between one Docker instance and another Docker instance. And so in this case, that's called a broker. And so in this system, when people actually went and measured it, they found that these brokers actually took 36% of the time approximately, uh, or 36% 36, uh, 36 of the latency. So, you know, if, um, and this is kind of for a state of the art kind of um, way of running this. This is not kind of the baseline where we can still improvement and improve it and so on, but just the idea of synchronizing between different Dockers running on different machines, that takes time for obvious reasons, like for data transfer overhead, but just for synchronization. And, you know, depending on how many machines I dedicate for this broker, how many requests it can process each second and so on. And so, um, so in this case, when it, we measured it, um, it was actually like 36%, just quite a large number. And so in this case, you know, the multi-device overhead, just running this on multiple devices incurred this latency overhead of 36%. Um, so, yeah, so this is an example of a system where, you know, it is a DNN centric workload. The main thing that's running is a deep neural network to do this workload, but something completely unrelated to my application uh, incurred the overhead. So this isn't, this isn't even part of the application, but it's just part of scaling it to multiple devices uh, on a system. Any, any questions uh, or thoughts about this part? Um, yeah, I think this, uh, this specific lecture would work really well if, if there's more discussion. Uh, just because, like I said, it's not it's not kind of a grounded and well-established topic yet. It's something people are starting to pay attention to. And so you'll see all those white papers and all those uh, new kind of, uh, in your further reading, actually, a new kind of um, uh, yeah proposal papers from people at Google and, and so on, saying, oh, we need to pay attention to this, you know. In the Google example, people worked hard on this TPU, and they keep boasting, you know, their improvements of 10x here, 100x there, and so on. But you still need to measure the thing end to end and see whether it actually gives you that improvement. Um, and the same is true when it comes to something like Microsoft System, which we'll also discuss. Um, you know, and they they were paying a bit more attention to those um, you know overheads, and that's why you will find that they really cared about where that FPGA sits in their system. But but let's uh, let's continue, and I'll talk about that one later. So, so now moving down from the system level, right? So this container and Docker and scaling to multiple devices, let's look at the application itself. And so what's happening in that application? Is it simply, you know, one end-to-end -end neural network? And the answer is typically is no. You know, typically um, to run an end-to-end -end system like this, you don't just run one end-to-end -end neural network. Um, I think people really want that to happen but that's not the current reality, at least. Um, so uh, one good example is actually speech recognition, where for the longest time we had these standalone 
language models, the standalone, you know, hidden Markov models to do whatever. And only one part of it, uh, like the speech modeling, was done using an LSTM-based uh, layer. But only now people are starting to move towards end-to-end -end speech recognition. Uh, well, maybe not now, maybe like a few years ago now, two or three years ago. Um, but that's one example where we started off by a system which wasn't, you know, completely deep learning, and then it's starting to become, you know, an end-to-end -end deep neural network. But in many of those systems, that's not the case yet. So, you know, you have, um, in this case, your ingest, and this is purely not a deep neural network uh, operation. It's basically extracting frames from a video stream, depending on the format of that video stream, sometimes resizing, uh, doing a bunch of overhead, just logging how many frames I have, uh, where I am in terms of time and so on. And so, so that's purely not deep learning. But then the blue stuff shaded here, so that's in the detection part and the identification part, that's where deep learning is happening. Let's look at detection. Um, so, you know, you have a deep neural network running after, you know, you, you resize your frames and everything, um, and then you detect a face but then you need to crop that face out of the image. You need to resize it so that you can feed it to the next layer or the next part of your neural network. So basically, you know, you have an image um, and you have a bunch of faces in it. And then, you know, face detection gives you those bounding boxes. And then, but you'd need to take those and then feed them downstream to another, you know, deep neural network. And that has a specific input resolution. So, you know, you need to resize those faces to make sure it fits um, that, uh, that other neural network. Um, and then, you know, you have other stuff happening, you know, in TensorFlow, just you know, things like garbage collection, you know, uh, various things. Networking and networking and Kafka here, these will still refer to things that happen at the system level, just overheads on this device, on this node or in this container to be able to communicate. So it's not just the brokers on other machines that have that overhead, but also stuff that's happening uh, on this container image. And then we have the identification, which is supposed to be you know, a simple you know, face in, deep neural network and face out. Um, but you, know, you still have other overheads here, a bit smaller, like 8.3%. Um, but again, in kind of managing the images, um, networking, um, running various functions um, through NumPy in this, in this example, and so on. So, so now kind of moving down from the system level, we take a look at you know, these containers that are supposed to be running the application, and we still find more overheads. Um, and so now, um, as you can see, in some cases, the, the AI portion or the deep neural network is no longer the majority of the workload. And so as you're looking at these pie charts, just think about Handel's log n, right? So if I'm the system designer and I'm trying to optimize this, should I spend my time kind of creating a TPU to optimize this 42% or should I find a better system architecture to optimize the rest of this? Um, and that's, that's, a, that's a very a much harder problem to solve because typically your systems need to run, need to be very general. They need to run many different things. Um, not just AI, not just deep neural networks. And so uh, designing at the system level um, is usually quite challenging. And you usually do it with cost considerations in mind even before kind of um, a specific application performance. Any questions here or comments, or random thoughts? No? Okay. So, I mean, if you if you want to take kind of if you want to take away one number, um, you know, uh, about this pre and post processing overhead, um, there there isn't one number. But if you want to take away one number, it's typically kind of in the thirty percent range, and that's based on two or three papers that I've read. So it's not based on many things, but uh, it's also one of the papers in your further reading here. Um, and they measure kind of overheads of database access um, and various other things that you need to do. And they say it, it's never below 30%. So our example, which you know, we did at the beginning of the lecture is actually quite realistic. So if you actually take the, the deep neural network and you speed it up 10X, you're still in kind of trouble because you only get this 2.2X improvement in your overall system. Um, 
Okay, so we talked about you know system level, application level. Now let's look at the hardware and why some of these um, overheads happen in our hardware systems. Like what's the, what is typically the underlying reason behind it? And what are sources of additional overhead that I need to take into account uh, when I'm designing these systems uh, and how can I get around them? So here I'm showing you know, a very simple PCIe attached GPU. And that's typically how accelerators run. You need to run your operator. So yeah, when, when I was much younger, I thought, you know, why do we still have you know, all these CPUs in data centers? Right? Uh, why don't we just put GPUs? And the answer is that you know, I need to run an operating system somewhere. Right? And so typically that's done on a, they call it host CPU. So that hosts the accelerator. That's, um, that's the main kind of um, um, data marshaller. You know, it, it, it controls the accelerator. It tells it what to do, uh, basically. And so, uh, you know, you have a data center cable coming in over Ethernet, typically 40 gig Ethernet now, um, and moving to 100. Um, and then it goes into the CPU, and that's how data arrives at the CPU. The CPU has its own, you know, main memory or CPU memory. And then over PCIe, you can transfer data to a GPU memory, which is its own dedicated, you know, piece of memory. So you should already know this part. Um, so, you know, a typical data center scenario is that, you know, the model sits somewhere in the CPU memory, um, or even it sits in storage somewhere first, but then it's copied to a CPU memory, and then we have to transfer it over to the GPU. So that takes time, right? Uh, but that's usually kind of a one-time cost that's easily amortized because, you know, it transfers the model to the GPU, and then you run inference on it hundreds of times or millions of times or something. So usually that's kind of a small overhead and something that's not too bad. But then when you run this model these millions of times, you need to run it with new input data every time so that it's meaningful. And so where do you get this data from? So it arrives obviously over you know, your ethernet cable here. And then it goes to the CPU, stored in main memory of the CPU. Um, and then you initiate a PCIe transfer, you store, you store it in the GPU main memory. Um, and then you run the inference and you send the result back to the CPU. So, so what's the overhead here? Um, like what's, what's wrong with that picture so far? The kernel scheduler, that's, um, I mean, that's a detailed form of overhead, which sure, I mean, uh, but, but there's an even more obvious one, which is, you know, just the data transfer itself, right? So while I'm transferring the data, um, will my GPU sit idle, like just waiting for the data? Uh, so in some cases it could, um, but basically, um, typically we actually don't let this, the, the GPU sit idle, right? Typically we would overlap data transfer with computation. And that's one of the key kind of ways of um, overcoming this kind of hardware overhead. So, you know, while I'm transferring the data to the GPU, I would be running something else on the GPU. And then while I'm running, you know, this first inference on the GPU, I'm transferring the data for the second inference. Uh, and so this, you know, predicates on the fact that the GPU memory can fit both pieces of data uh, at the same time, because I need to kind of transfer one while I'm using the other one. Um, but, you know, your input data is usually much smaller than the model size which means there's usually room for it uh, in your GPU main memory. So, and you know, it's important to kind of distinguish between two kinds of overheads at this point, because you, know, you have overheads that will impact your throughput and you have impact, uh, overheads that will impact your latency. And so, so which one of those is more important actually? And, and by overlapping, you know, data transfer and uh, like uh, inference, for example, in our case, which one of those am I fixing? No. You're fixing throughput, exactly. So you're making sure that the device is busy and that you're doing more operations in a unit of time, so you're fixing throughput. Um, but latency is still a problem, right? Because typically for these systems, you know, you're holding your phone and you're waiting for the answer to come back. Uh, so, you know, you're transcribing your speech to text or something, or, you know, you're taking a photo and you want it to look pretty, 
And so it gets sent to the data center in some cases, does that uh, processing. And you know, all of, all of this now counts. The PCIe transfer counts, um, the execution on the GPU counts, the overhead of just transferring this within your data center network. So your data center network speed matters. Obviously the link to your data center as well, whether you're on 4G, 5G, whatever, that's all uh, contributes to your latency as well. So, um, so really kind of uh, keep in mind this distinction between throughput and latency and how the different overheads will impact one or the other. Uh, and latency is typically the harder one to solve um, because it's always kind of on your critical path. You can't overlap anything with it. Um, and so typically also we, you know, um, to, to get more throughput, we can have more GPUs, right? So we can scale the number of accelerators uh, or GPUs in this case, and then our throughput will, uh, will improve. And so why do we, do we do that? Of course, you know, as we saw at the application level, you have these, um, you know, these things that don't run on the GPU. Typically, it's just the DNN that runs on the GPU. So whether you know, you're decompressing an image or you're, um, you know, you're cropping it or resizing it or even those very simple operations, um, once you scale to multiple GPUs and you have one host um, kind of um, in charge of all of that pre-processing, quickly that host can become the bottleneck as well. So if I have this system architecture, what can I do now? How can I kind of improve um, you know, my overall performance if, if the CPU pre-processing is becoming the bottleneck and I'm unable to keep the GPUs busy? Come on, want new hands up or new uh, ideas? When he, sure. Add more CPUs. Well, that's, that's quite a simple and effective solution. So that's what NVIDIA did actually. So um, the latest A100 series, they said, okay, we will have a four GPU system and we'll put four, arms, um, four ARM cores instead of one x86 core. Um, and the reason for doing that, even though the x86 core is like 10 times more power hungry than the ARM one and 10 times more full, like more full featured, you only need a few operations uh, and a few simple things to run on the CPU. So even if I have a very simple core, but many of them, then that could be sufficient. And so that's what they did. They had one ARM core per GPU just to marshal data into it. Um, and I don't actually have numbers for how well this works, but um, but I can imagine that you know it would work better than having uh, a simple, a uh, single um, core um, to to process the data coming in. So we can increase the number of you know host CPUs in this case. Um, uh, another thing we can do um, is, and this becomes uh, very relevant when it comes you know to distributed training as well. Yeah, my animations are a bit broken, um, but um, you know. You, always, you also don't always want to go through the host, right? Through the host CPU. So if I'm doing distributed training and I want to transfer the gradients from one GPU to the other, but my CPU is already busy because the CPU is doing the pre-processing or the data augmentation for that you know, next round of training or something. And I just want to do the, the, you know, some DMA transfer or some transfer from one GPU memory to the other GPU memory to reduce all the gradients, then you know, at the system level, what I can do is also just, you know, connect the GPUs together. And so in NVIDIA's case, they have this NVLink, which is a very high bandwidth link between GPUs. Um, I believe uh, TPUs also have a very interesting connectivity. I think it's like a ring connectivity between four TPUs called TPU pods, I think. Um, and so having tightly coupled accelerators can benefit you for things like um, a distributed workload. Whether it's you know, a single inference that distributed over multiple devices, that's way less common, but mainly for training where you have um, a model split over multiple devices and you need to kind of synchronize between them every now and then. Um, and we'll talk a lot more about distributed training in the next lecture, but this is just kind of a preview of how we can get rid of some of those overheads. Um, when when running on multiple GPUs. Okay, questions on this part?
Okay. So another um, another interesting thing that you know data center providers did at the system level to kind of um, overcome some of these overheads is you know um, stick an FPGA before the host CPU. Um, and again, we will discuss this in more depth, hopefully in the distributed training um, uh, lecture. But uh, so that's what Microsoft is doing. They said, okay, if I have you know this overhead of going from the CPU and then a PCIe transfer to the GPU um, or the accelerator, then why don't I you know circumvent this whole thing by putting the FPGA before the CPU? And just to be clear, their first version of this looked like this. It looked like you know. CPU, PCIe, FPGA, right? So, you know, that's, you know, your textbook way, Ethernet. So that's your textbook way of connecting any accelerator. That's how you do it. You connect, you know, your accelerator on the PCIe bus of a CPU. And they actually had an interesting uh, FPGA only, you know, network here to connect FPGAs together. Uh, but then in their next, second iteration, which is the one that they scaled to, I think, all of their data centers now, is that they put the FPGA first uh, to intercept data um, at the Ethernet point or, um, you know, before, this, before the host completely. And so what this allows me to do is, you know, your data is coming in, you do the inference on the FPGA, and then you send it back out. So you don't even incur this overhead, latency overhead of, you know, um, transferring data over PCIe or, or doing any of that stuff that we were just discussing. Uh, but instead, you know, you're intercepting data before it even goes to the CPU, before it becomes bottlenecked by any operations that the CPU is doing and so on. So, um, um, so yeah, so sticking this FPGA here can uh, <clears throat> reduce latency that way if you're doing inference on the actual FPGA. If you're not doing inference on the FPGA and you still need to send your data to a GPU, at least now you have an additional accelerator kind of in your network to do some of these pre-processing functions. So for many of this inline pre-processing, you know, even cropping, resizing, decompression, decryption, all of this stuff happens often at the data center because you need to encrypt your data, you need to compress it to be able to store it. Uh, you need to do cropping and resizing just for each application, for example. Instead of doing it on a CPU, now you can do it on an FPGA which in some cases you know, can get you an order of magnitude, up to two orders of magnitude faster uh, latency than doing it on a CPU. Yeah? Uh, what do you mean by extra layer? Mm -hmm. um, right. So. So there is some latency incurred on the FPGA, so that's correct. Um, obviously, if you're not using the FPGA, you can just bypass it. Um, even if you bypass it through the, the FPGA, this could mean like two cycles of latency, which is typically nothing. If you're running at like a 400 megahertz clock speed, that's, that's very small. Um, so because I want you, when you look at an FPGA and a CPU, the FPGA is kind of you're programming a hardware circuit onto it. So uh, typically what you do is that you try to match the line rate with that hardware circuit. That means it becomes, they call it bump in the wire architecture. It's typically like a very small overhead in your, uh, in your just transferring from point A to point B, even if you're doing processing in the middle and you try to minimize that latency as much as possible when you're designing the hardware. When you think of a CPU, it's very different because you know, data is sent there, um, and you have this operating system running. And then on top of the operating system, you have a virtual machine. And then you have you know, this Docker. And so just the latency of getting a command through that operating system is way more. And it also, you know, it, it sits in you know, thread queues and, and various other things. So it's not, you, you, you typically can't quantify that latency. You can't say it will take you know, five cycles at 400 megahertz, so it's this number. No, you can't do it that way. It's like oh, my worst case latency is you know, three seconds or something. But my best case latency, if nothing is running there, it's half a second. And so, um, so yes, there is some latency overhead, but I would say it's almost negligible compared to something like a CPU. Um, so just because of this, you know, 
all of these layers of the stack are not running on the FPGA. It could be implementing part of it, but they're not uh, explicitly running there. So, yeah, but that's a good point. Um, so, and I mean, um, putting FPGAs to handle these pre-processing functions um, is not the only thing people have been doing. So NVIDIA also has these um, blue field um, chips that they just created. They call them a DPU, um, data center processing unit. It's basically to, um, to handle all of these, you know, networking and packet processing and pre-processing functions that you, uh, you need to do before sending your data into uh, a data center node. Uh, and typically people had, you know, ASICs here, um, non-programmable ASICs. So you would have, you know, uh, a certain packet processing protocol or a software defined networking protocol that's, you know, stuck on there and you do some of this packet processing and that's it. But, you know, NVIDIA, obviously, because they're <clears throat> creating all of these systems, they realized, you know, oh, MDEL's law exists and there is other stuff that's running. It's not just whatever makes it to the GPU. So we need to make sure that that runs fast as well. So I haven't taken a closer look at these blue, blue field chips, but it's interesting to see kind of a company like NVIDIA saying, oh, we, it's not just the GPU that we have to worry about. It's this other stuff to be able to scale our workload. And that means that they know what Amdahl's law is. That means that they won't run into trouble. Um, okay, so, you know, we, we looked now at these different layers of the stack, um, you know, and we saw how there is, you know, a lot of overhead at each layer. And it adds up and some of it overlaps as well between layers. But, um, but, you know, the main thing to keep in mind is that when you're running a DNN, when you actually want to deploy it, it's not, you know, this profiling that you did in, in the first assignment uh, where, you know, you measured how fast the deep neural network runs on various platforms and so on. No, it's, it's a lot of other stuff that happens in between as well. And you need to take care of that stuff when um, you're, you're creating a system architecture or you're trying to build, you know, um, a computer to do the whole thing. Okay, so for the, for the re rest of this lecture, I will uh, kind of go through some very interesting ideas um, um, that people have been working on uh, related to those system level issues, related to pre-processing and, and so on. And, and these are kind of, um, um, th they're somewhat unrelated ideas, but I think they're all quite interesting. Um, and, and they kind of open up the way we think about those systems and how we can optimize them. And the first one that I really like is this, uh, you know, there was this very simple paper, I think from Uber Labs, uh, and it's also in your um, kind of further reading, right? And so th the simple application level pipeline here is that, you know, we have uh, JPEG images coming in, um, but, you know, to feed those JPEG images into a neural network, we need to do decompression, and that's often done on a CPU. Uh, and by the way, there is a lot of research to move JPEG decompression or image decompression in general to GPUs. JPEG is not very parallelizable because it has something called Huffman encoding, but people have been trying to find new um, ways of compressing images which are more parallelizable. So I've seen many papers come up on that. But anyways, for now we'll assume that this is running on the CPU and then we do uh, you know, DNN inference on a GPU or an accelerator. And you know what JPEG looks like, uh, something like this, you know, um, well, this is compression actually. So you start with an RGB image and then you convert it to this YCB CR, uh, radiance and chrome, I don't, I don't remember, luminance, something like that. So it's a, just a different format uh, of storing the image. And then you run discrete cosine transform on top of that. Um, so, um, that's similar to FFT, basically, but uh, it's only one part of the FFT, the cosine part. And then you run these Huffman codes, which actually assigns different bit lengths to each, um, to each color, to each pixel value, basically. And so if I want to run this now on this um, inference accelerator, I need to do the opposite. So that's what I have here coming in, a JPEG image. I need to do Huffman decoding. I need to do uh, inverse discrete cosine transform and then uh, do the color space mapping. And so the main two blocks here are Huffman decoding 
and DCT. And so uh, what people found in this paper is that, you know, um, we don't actually have to do the whole of JPEG decompression. Uh, so instead of doing the whole thing, I will just do the Huffman decoding so that every pixel has the same number of bits. Um, and then I'll feed those DCT coefficients without doing the inverse DCT straight into a deep neural network. And I'll see what happens. Uh, and what they found is that they actually get an accuracy improvement uh, and obviously a runtime improvement. The runtime improvement is because now you've taken away a chunk um, of your uh, pre-processing in the system, which used to take time, latency and throughput impact. But now, um, you know, you've taken it away, but they actually found that they improve accuracy as well. And, uh, you know, they have some analysis in the paper, which I recommend reading, um, where they think about why this happened and so on. And they said, actually, the first few layers of your deep neural network, they were doing that exactly that. They were finding the spectral components or the frequency components of the image. Um, so it was like running a DCT filter on top of the image. And so they found that, that when you do that and you do some retraining, you don't only regain the accuracy, you actually improve on accuracy as well. So I thought that was kind of a neat idea where now you're thinking about your pre-processing system um, and you, know, you see what you have in, in terms of pre-processing, but you also start to eliminate some, of, some parts of the system um, with a, from an algorithmic standpoint, right? So you're looking at what I can absorb into the deep neural network, which means it will run on an accelerator and it will be fast, or I can easily control how fast it runs. Um, so yeah, so I, th I thought that was a neat idea. And when you're thinking about system design, this usually comes up in my head um, as a good co-design opportunity between the system, um, so how, how many CPUs I need to have and how many GPUs, and also the algorithm, which is how I'm running the deep neural network and what I'm running before it and so on. Okay, now jumping to another idea. Um, and you know, this idea of running something on a mobile device. Um, so you know, all of the big companies, they want to avoid all of these system level problems. They want to just run stuff on your own phones. Uh, and the main reason for that is, you know, you, you plug in your phone in the electricity outlet at night, right? So you're paying the electric bill, not them. So the biggest um, cost of running a data center is actually the electric bill. Um, next, I think, is the capex of buying the machines, and next is the uh, money to give to the employees at the data center. So, so electricity is the biggest thing, and then if you just run it on your own device, that's much better for them. And so, but what happens here? So um, on your phone, unlike a data center, on your phone, you have something called a system on chip. So uh, that means that I have multiple devices, but they're not connected through PCIe. They're not connected through ethernet. They're connected um, together on the same chip through a shared memory system. And so when you think about running stuff on your phone, you no longer have that PCIe or data transfer overhead from your host to the accelerator because all of the devices can access the same memory. So it's like in, in the previous picture, where we had, you know, CPU with its memory and, you know, GPU with its memory. Um, so on a, on a phone, it's like, you know, this is the same memory. So if data comes here and the CPU can access it, so can the GPU just by fi figuring out the right address. Uh, so there is no copy overhead or data transfer overhead there. So that's one thing to keep in mind. However, another thing to keep in mind is that this chip, even though it has so many devices on it, is way smaller than one of those chips in the data center. So, you know, um, you're, you should already know this, but basically it's about five watts of power or 10 watts of power in some cases, compared to 300 watts for a, or 400 watts for a server grade GPU. So it's also, so, you know, it doesn't have this overhead. And so that's nice, but it's also not very capable. It can't do much. So typically what happens is that, you know, we offload computations to a server. So you get your data, you do some things on the phone, like data ingest, some data pre-processing, uh, sometimes even part of the neural network, but then you send the rest of it um, to, the, uh, to the cloud to run it on a TPU or something. And that was actually the main motivation behind the TPU uh, when Google kind of realized um, if all of our users use speech recognition for three minutes a day, 
then we need to double the data center capacity, right? And so that's because you know we need to transfer that data. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question, and I I don't have a good figure for you, um, but that would be a nice topic for you know, a term paper, just diving deep into kind of this, uh, this system level profiling and, you know, what is the breakdown between those different things. I will tell you that data transfer over 5G um, is significantly um, smaller um, than previous, like, especially in terms of latency, significantly smaller than previous generations, which makes many of these systems, uh, which makes the communication in many of these systems not no longer the bottleneck. Um, so that's kind of a hand wavy answer, but what I saw from various conversations in Samsung uh, that you know, 5G is the answer basically. <laughs> so, and people are working on 6G now as well and stuff like that. But uh, basically, this latency is shrinking very quickly. Um, yeah. uh, but people are still looking into ways of kind of eliminating the overhead of this latency, especially that you know 5G is not available everywhere, even in countries like the US, but definitely not in other countries. Um, and so, uh, you know, what people are doing there, people are seeing things like, you know, how can I compress, um, you know, the data before transmission? Or some people are even looking at, you know, running a piece of a neural network on the device and then splitting the neural network where my activations are very small or very compressible, doing that compression, sending it to the data center and then doing the rest of the computation there. Um, and uh, yeah, or, or only offloading, for example, when, you, when a faster network is available. So if, if you, know, you only have 3G available, I won't offload. I'll just run the whole thing on device. And uh, if I have 5G available, then I'll transfer it to the data center. And so that gives me a better kind of quality of service trade-off. And so, um, so yeah, so that's kind of, uh, th these are the kind of research problems that people are looking at now. Um, and it's mainly centered around, you know, sending that data between the device and the cloud and what do I run on the device and what do I run on the cloud. In an ideal case, everything would run on device. Um, and so what are the benefits of that? Can someone, uh, can someone guess? So. Yeah, save money for Google, basically. Yeah, so that's one thing. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Latency is a big one because you know you you'll never. Yeah, I mean it depends on how slow your phone is, but uh, in terms of overhead of latency, it's definitely smaller when everything is on device and you don't need to be connected even. So, privacy concerns exactly. So, what if you don't want your data to leave the device, right? So, um, so it's much better to run it on device this way. And I think that that's what the cloud, how the cloud providers are usually selling it, as you know, we're keeping your data secure. That's why you want to kind of buy the new phone and it will have this pixel chip or whatever it's called. And then, um, but behind the scenes there, this is also kind of financially motivated, obviously, because uh, that saves them money and the data center, so. Okay. Um, now we'll switch gears to kind of another idea, still sticking with uh, phones and kind of running stuff on device. And we'll take a look at, you know, what does the imaging pipeline look like on a device, um, on a phone, for example. You know, you have your camera, so that's the sensor. Then you go through something called an ISP, an image signal processor. And what that does is that it does some processing to your, um, your pixels to make the image look nice. Um, so typically, the image coming off of your camera sensor if you view it, it will look really dark. It will almost look monochrome. Um, but then um, you, and, and it's, all, it's also, they have this thing called a Bayer pattern. Who, who knows what that is? No? So basically your, 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 your sensor is two dimensional, but your image is actually three dimensional. It has RGB, it has three channels. Um, so what happens is that, you know, one, um, what, what your sensor actually looks like is something like this. And then you have this Bayer pattern where this pixel captures red light. This one captures green. This one captures blue. 
and then this one captures red again. So you need to take that pattern and figure out how to create three channels out of it. So that's one thing that the ISP does. Another thing is HDR. So you know, taking multiple images at different exposures, combining them, that's, uh, that used to be done later. Now it's done even at the ISP level. So it's all things to make your image look pretty, basically. And so I would transfer, uh, yeah, Harish. Uh, it's a device, sometimes it's on the SOC, sometimes it's even a standalone chip, but increasingly it's part of the SOC. Yeah. So you'll find Qualcomm creating those and putting them on their Snapdragon chips. Um, and this is actually a poorly researched area. There are a couple of people working on it, but most of the secret sauce is with people like Qualcomm and Apple. Um, so and Samsung. So um, then, you know, if I want to store this image on the phone, I usually compress it. So we talked about JPEG, that's usually what people use um, or other formats like that. And then I would store it on kind of the phone memory uh, or even the phone storage. Um, then if I want to do some processing on this, so kind of detect who's in the image or um, do some effect or something before I upload it to, um, to some platform, then I would, read it, I would read the image again from storage. I would send it to my CPU memory. I need to decompress it typically first. And we talked a bit about how to optimize that. And then I can do the processing finally. Um, and you know, I can process it on the CPU or if I have a dedicated neural processing unit that I can do it there. And so there's this very long pipeline, even though it's just on this phone, there's actually a very long pipeline of things that happen. There's latency uh, associated with that pipeline. And there's also energy consumption. Uh, and you have you know, a limited battery life. So, so this is actually quite time consuming, especially if all you want from the image is some metadata, like what's in that image or, or something like that. So in this case, I'm actually spending a lot of overhead just you know, sending it through that ISP. Um, and typically the split is like 50% of your energy of capturing an image is in the camera. Uh, sensor and 50% is, is in the ISP. So it's not, it's not a small portion. Uh, your ISP can also degrade your quality if you're doing inference using a DNN later. And people have measured that, like different color processing. If you, cap, if you like take photos using one phone and then try to run them on another phone, um, on a neural network trained for phone A, then you can degrade accuracy by more than 50%. So it's quite serious. Um, and that points to how unrobust neural networks are in some cases, but also uh, to how uh, important these steps are. So train a neural network on raw pixels, basically coming from the sensor. So that's a really good question, actually. And you will see papers kind of talking about that and trying to do that. The main issue people face there is that this ISP step actually maps your image to a standard color space typically, other than the demosaicing and the HDR and stuff, there is a color space mapping step, which people have found to be very important because different sensors will give you different outputs. And then what the ISP does is that it maps all of, they call it color gamut, I think. Uh, they, it maps it all to a single color gamut. Um, what is it called? RGB something? sRGB, so standard RGB color gamut. So by doing that, you're actually reducing the variance in your image data set by a lot, making it much easier to actually run neural networks or train neural networks with these kind of images. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, so it's very different between a Google and an Apple phone, but you will find uh, slight differences between two identical sensors as well because of manufacturing differences, but also because of, you know, um, temperature, like how hot it is today or something like that. And so, so I'm saying that, you know, part of this ISP function is to map to the standard color space, which, you know, hides some of that variability coming from the sensor. Uh, so it's still good, but also different things you do here, other than this color space mapping, um, makes your picture look quite different. And that's why, you know, pictures from a Huawei phone or an Apple phone or a Google phone, they look different, right? Um, and that's also because of the ISP. And that can affect your inference. And then you have compression before you even get to run this thing on a neural network. And so you lose information that way. 
And so if you're running a super resolution algorithm, which is something that we often have to optimize um, for zooming in, for example, then um, you, know, you, you lose information before you even get to run that algorithm. And just generally, you know, you're, you know, you're wasting storage, you're wasting energy. And so, um, yeah, and that's how, you know, if, if you just want to figure out what's in the image, uh, for example, you know, this is a cat, then what if we can do it in a better way, right? And so uh, I, I really like this idea of thinking about, you know, this is one example of a system where we can optimize it if we, um, if we just want that metadata out of that image, just analytics out of that image, instead of having you know, one image pipeline to do everything for us, to give us pretty images, but also give us metadata. And so in this case, um, there are some very interesting ideas on how to bring the processing much closer to the sensor. Um, and then everything you propagate downstream is just a very small piece of metadata, which is you know, bytes or kilobytes instead of you know, megabytes uh, or even gigabytes in some cases for the image itself. Um, and so I'll, I'll show this one example from Sony, kind of because they create a lot of those camera sensors actually. Um, but there are many examples out there looking into optimizing this. And in this case, you know, Sony said, you know, 3D stacking of chips exists. Why don't we take our pixel chip we're not the Google one. This is an actual pixel array. So this is a camera sensor. Um, and we just stick it on top of a logic chip. So now I'm putting a DNN accelerator, custom designed piece of hardware on my camera sensor. Uh, I'm connecting the two together. And so, you know, and this, uh, and this is all taken from their website, but basically they call it the intelligent vision sensor. So now if I capture an image, I have the option you know, to output the captured image by just bypassing this accelerator completely. But I also have the option of just propagating the metadata downstream. So you know, when I look at this pipeline now, coming out from my you know, intelligent sensor will not be the whole image and spending all of that time in the ISP doing compression for it. It will just be the word cat, right? Right from here. And so it will save a lot of energy and a lot of latency as well. And so metadata is one option for output. Um, yeah, different image formats or region of interest image. So uh, for the example of face detection, you know, you've already detected the faces, you've already done part of this pre-processing, you've already cropped it, and that's what you propagate downstream. Uh, and so in some cases, this can actually kind of, you know, cut your, you know, the energy of doing this whole thing by half or something, uh, just because you are, um, especially in this first case, we're just transferring kind of the image class, then, um, yeah, you're replacing gigabytes by bytes uh, in your whole, um, you know, phone imaging pipeline. And so that, um, that can be really advantageous. And this is, you know, an active area of research. This thing was released for kind of preview like last year or the year before. So people are still looking into this and it, this definitely didn't make it into any products that I know of yet, so. Okay, so that's all I have for today. Uh, we kind of went over uh, an introduction to deep learning systems, how we run stuff in data centers and on phones, uh, and, the and the system level considerations in those parts. Um, the main takeaway is, you know, Amdahl's law. It's not just a deep neural network that we're optimizing and making sure it runs fast. There's other stuff that's going on. And there's other stuff that's going on in different layers of the stack and depending on what device you use and how many devices you use and so on. We also went quickly over some emerging topics and some interesting ideas. So related to, you know, uh, this JPEG decompression uh, co-design example, uh, mobile inference and offloading, and finally this uh, near sensor processing idea. Um, and by the way, people have also thought about integrating this accelerator within the sensor itself. Uh, but that's even more challenging. Uh, but um, yeah, um, here's the further reading. I think these are quite interesting papers. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll stick around if there are any questions. Thanks. <laughs>